Yay. Welcome to the Pope on Film. I'm Bunny Williams, and with me is... Tom Cruise. Thank you for being our special guest today, Mr. Cruise. So what about Scientology? What can you tell Oh, well... What's the truth? Well, you know, we celebrities don't get the Scientology that normal human beings get. Like... Because I'm a celebrity, I get pampered, I get what I want, I have people who follow me around and do whatever I want. So I really don't get as much of the crazy that's out there. But I can't be him anymore. I hate Scientology so much (laughs) that I can no longer continue with this farce. (laughs) Hi, my name is Reverend Steve Galindo. Uh, founder of the Church of Ed Wood and um, avid boob fan. I'm a big fan of boobs. Boobs are good. Yes, they are very nice. Doesn't boobs matter. Are good. I'm, I'm a very big fan. Doesn't matter the size. I mean, they, they could be big or small. Just the fact that they're there, you know, makes me feel good. Like giving someone a Hallmark card. Might not mean that much, but they're there. You know, they it's there. They just make you happy. You know. Yeah. What episode is this? Is this episode six? This is episode six. Yes, we should probably announce that regularly at the beginning of the show. But hey. Well, that's that's awesome. Episode six. Yay! We're at episode, episode six. Four more episodes before double digits. Nice. That'll be a big deal. Yeah. We should do an important movie for episode 10, like Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages? Do Rock of Ages again? Just I'm down. I love that movie. I love that movie. I love I'm down. Movie. And I, I love that movie, and I consider it a good movie. <laughs> I consider it a bad movie, but in a good way. So it's like two sides of the same coin. Yes. Yes. I wanted to mention something before we got started on this week's movie. All right. I heard an album uh, recently that I have fallen in love with. And it's such a wonderful album that it reminded me uh, of a of a of a good movie. It reminded me of of seeing a a Wes Anderson film. Like, I love Wes Anderson. I love him as a director, and his movies are just so uh, quaint and charming and and intricately detailed that you automatically want to dive into those movies and live in the world of these films. You want to, to be a part of them, and it's just this wonderful experience. You just want to live in these films. And I felt that with this album, uh, it came out on October 21st. I heard it a couple of days, like a, like a week before, and I just, I fell in love with it, and I, I, I listened to it all the way through, and I listened to it again, and then I heard it the next day on the ride to work, and I'm, I'm just absolutely obsessed with it. It's my new favorite obsession, and it is called Primus. And the Chocolate Factory. And it is the band Primus. Primus. It is the band Primus, the original lineup of Primus, doing the entire soundtrack to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. 1971, Gene Wilder. Yes, oh, the best. And it's just... One of my favorite Primus albums, like Sailing the Seas of Cheese, that's like a classic, absolute, 100% perfect album. But I really like it when they do covers, and they hardly ever do covers, Primus does, which is surprising because they have such a unique style. But this album from beginning to end is just amazing. It's songs that you know and songs that you love, but in that Primus style and in such an original way that I felt like I was watching a Wes Anderson film, I wanted to live in this album. 
I just wanted to live in their bizarre and dark uh, Willy Wonka. It's an amazing album. It's an amazing I, album. I see own. that it is on iTunes, so people can check it out when they're subscribing to our show. Yes, it's absolutely incredible. And again, if you if you don't subscribe to our show, then uh, you love terrorists. And that's bad. You should hate terrorists and subscribe to our show. But if you don't subscribe to our show, then ISIS is just going to come and storm America, and we're all going to be slaves. And aren't you going to feel bad because you didn't subscribe to our podcast on iTunes? And you would have to go to the third and a half circle of hell, which is actually more of a rhomboid. I, yeah, and I heard that they have a Cinnabon, though, so that's that's at least that's, something good. That makes hell a little nicer, yeah, yeah. I hear you know, they just got to... us Savaros, but this their pizza is kind of weird. Yeah. You know, like 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 Sabaro's pizza is like 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 a limp dick. Like you're holding the crust, and then everything else is just flopping down. <laughs> are, are they still in business? I don't know if they're still in business. I I don't know, but where was it that I saw? Uh, it might have been Dairy Queen, where you can get Orange Julius. Orange Julius, really? I thought they had disappeared. Now, I, I hate the, Orange Julius, but the nostalgia value alone just makes my heart warm. Yeah, like hot dog on a stick. I'm not going to eat your food. I'm not going to go to your establishment, but I'm happy that you're there next to the sunglass hut and just stay there so I can laugh when I walk past your employees. And they're weird there are, outfits. there are a lot of things that I am liking now that I'm older that I didn't like at the time. Well, Probably like for that team, this is too popular and stuff like that. Like, the, the two big ones, Cindy Lauper and Boy George. Ooh. Which, when I, was, when I was at that age, I was much more of a metalhead, so, you know... I can't do this music. <laughs> you know, I need Black Sabbath. But now that I'm yeah. older, it's like, they're both pretty interesting. I, 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 I really love Boy George's balls. Yeah. You know, not in a licking kind of a way, but in that very no, same kind of Ed Wood, I, this is me, go fuck yourself kind of way. Yeah. You know, he was not putting huh. on an act. Yeah. You know, well, he kind of was, but it was his act. You know. When I when I was growing up, like in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, like I, I I didn't care too much about popular music. I didn't care too much about what everybody else was really into. But I was obsessed. I was obsessed with Doctor Demento, and I was obsessed with Weird Al Yankovic. Oh, Weird Al is a fucking genius. It's he amazing. Is just a genius. It's amazing that I was in third grade and I was obsessed with Weird Al Yankovic, and now I have a daughter who's in fourth grade and is obsessed with Weird Al Yankovic. It's quite amazing. I can't think of too many other musical artists that that it's possible to do that. My brother, I am. my older brother, used to just hate. Used to, we're we're good <laughs> friends now, my older brother and I, but. For most of our lives, we just hated each other with a passion, and he used to just rip me a new one because I loved Weird Al Yankovic, and he was just, Weird Al Yankovic, he's stupid, oh man, but then the music he was listening to, all of those people are gone now, all of those people are gone, but somehow the guy who who made my bologna is still around. And he's still culturally relevant. I have no idea how he did that, but I'm happy that he's there. I am happy that he's there, too, but I am having a problem with Weird Al these days where I have completely lost track of what he's parodying anymore. See, that's why I'm happy that I have I have the right amount of kids at the right age so I can still at least somewhat understand what is popular because I've got a three-year-old 
and I've got a nine-year-old, and I've got one about to be 13. So I've got a really good gamut of young children so that I can, like, yeah. I was really proud of myself that the last album that Willie Yankovic released, that I was aware of the majority of the music that he was parroting. Yeah. And I don't think I would have known that if I hadn't had the young kids that I do. Yeah. So it's just going to take me a little while longer than usual to, like, warm up to his newest album. Yeah. You know, I've heard some of the songs, and I like them. They're, they sound like Weird Al. I like them. They're fun. But, like, I don't relate to them the way I used to. Yeah. Yeah, that's understandable. I actually hear that from a lot of people. A lot yeah. of people who are like not fully sure what music is popular nowadays, but incredible that he is still around and kicking, and he still looks like he's yeah. twenty years old. Yeah, don't don't get old. I really don't recommend it. You know, stop right now. You know. Stop so something tells me, like uh, like in the movie Scott Pilgrim versus the World, which I which I my whole family is just obsessed with. I think the reason why Weird Al Yankovic might be still be culturally relevant and why he looks so young is because he's never eaten meat in his entire life. He has always yeah. been a vegan, and so that means he has magical vegan powers. Yes. Which is probably what is keeping him relevant. He has yes. magical vegan powers. I love it when they make a carrot scream. That's that's a good trick. <laughs> yeah, that's a good trick. Yeah. You just pull it out of the ground and it's just like... Ah, ah, ah. Oh, I don't know when the last time was that I really got into a new Primus album, but hearing them do a bizarre Primus version of the Candyman, and oh, I've Got a Golden Ticket, and they do that bizarre boat ride song where Gene Wilder's just trying to fuck with the kids. And not only do they do these, you know, all of these bizarre songs and all of the Oompa Loompa songs and all that, but uh, Cheer Up Charlie is probably one of the sweetest songs they've ever written, they've ever really? they've ever recorded. Really beautiful. Just a beautiful, sweet little jam of a song. I always hated Cheer Up Charlie in the movie, but oh man, it's just, it's a beautiful album. It was like, hearing that album for the first time reminded me of the first time I heard Sgt. Pepper, or the White yeah. Album, or like those important concept albums, like uh, uh, Tommy's The Who, or something like that. Like it, like right. I just wanted to dive into that album, and and also uh, Willy Wonka and the Charlie Chocolate Factory is a whole lot better than that um, Tim Burton one. Oh God, yes! All the Oompa Loompas are the same. Are you kidding? I've I mean, got a theory, dude. I've got a theory. I have a lot of theories, but I have a theory about uh, Tim Burton's. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Okay. Because in the original book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, they wrote that the scene where Veruca Salt bites it, she is in a room with a uh, hundred squirrels and they're sorting nuts. So when they came, uh, when it came time to do that in the movie in uh, the 1970s, Willy Wonka. They said, well, it's impossible to train all of these squirrels, so we'll just make it something else. Because obviously no one in their right mind would ever train a hundred squirrels to do this, so let's just do something else. Tim Burton, I think, made Charlie and the Chocolate Factory simply as a challenge because the majority of the squirrels in that scene – are actually squirrels and not computer generated. He is oh, such okay. a weird madman that he actually trained a shit ton of squirrels, and those are primarily real squirrels in that scene. 
and I think the entire movie was made, number one, to torture that poor guy who had to do all the Oompa Loompas. Yes. Like waterboarding him by making <laughs> him do all of those all of those parts repeatedly. So, number one, he was torturing like a small Indian midget. And number two, he was trying to show Gene Wilder and uh, all of those people, I am crazy enough to train a hundred squirrels. <laughs> and also Christopher Lee's in it, so it, it can be forgiven for some things. I only saw it on its first run when it first like, came out on DVD. I haven't seen it since because I was just underwhelmed. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's okay, but Tim I, Burton's I next really... film, Tim Burton's yeah. next film, is going to shock the world because Johnny Depp is going to play a thirty-something Mexican man with a rugged, manly mustache who loves popcorn and boobs, and everyone's going to say, "Oh wow, what a what a what a drastic departure for Johnny Depp," and I am going to be holed up in my fortified bunker waiting to shoot Tim Burton because he is obsessed with me. I've talked about this before. <laughs> but And uh, I believe you. I believe it's you. Weird. I, 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 yeah. I think there is a strong Reverend Steve Tim Burton connection there. And Tim, Tim well, Tim Burton is basically your nemesis. Ooh, I have a nemesis. I'm so excited. You have a nemesis. I have a nemesis. Speaking of nemesis, um, did you ever see the movie Mystery Men? I love that movie. That movie was really ahead of its time. Because I feel like if someone made a big budget comic book movie parody now with the amazing cast that that movie had, oh, it would make millions of dollars. Like, it yeah. just came out at the wrong time, that film. It's a really yeah, wonderful Yeah, it, it definitely movie. did, because it, it, it's, it's a lot of fun, and they got a, a, a few of the ideas across very well. I, I really like... Well, I like Ben Stiller, and I don't know why the world has kind of turned against Ben Stiller. Uh, yeah. I hear he's kind of a dick. You know, but yeah. maybe that's why. I don't know. Um, but him doing his kind of Punisher riff was great. And I love Janine know. Garofalo. Absolutely yeah. love Janine Garofalo. And Eddie Izzard is in it. He is amazing. Yeah. And you know who is in that? You know who's in that movie way before he became culturally relevant? CeeLo Green is in that movie. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I keep thinking of the of the main guy, the main bad guy, whose name I always wind up forgetting, because I always want to call him Stephen Price from The House on Haunted Hill. Oh, you know what? I don't like remakes too much, but the remake of House on Haunted Hill is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Rush. Jeffrey Rush. There we go. I mean, he's one of those actors that is just always great in anything he does. You know, he's just very compelling and just brings you in. You know, he's yeah. great in the King's Speech, and he was great in Mystery Man. Yeah. He was really good in um, the Pirates of the Caribbean, too. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Although I only saw the first one of those. Um, the first one is good, and then the last one they did, number four, is surprisingly good. Number two and three, yeah. you can just kind of skip. They're not. Oh, okay. They're not that important. But the last one was surprisingly really, really good. And this is something you should Google. I mentioned it on my blog, reverendsteve.blogspot.com. But for some really, really weird, bizarre, random happenstance, Jeffrey Rush looks just exactly like deceased singer Elliot Smith. Okay. I'm like, not familiar with Elliot Smith. He he did a lot of really depressing songs, and then he shocked the world when he killed himself. Okay. Kind of like how uh, Kurt Cobain, the writer of the song I Hate Myself and Want to Die, shocked the world by killing himself. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. A lot of Elliot Smith songs were just, they were all moody and all depressing and all sad, and then somehow uh, he decided to kill himself. His music is beautiful, but he always had this strange face like like he had a like a like a pimple outbreak when he was young and he didn't have proactive like really like a like a white man uh Edward James almost sort of a pock face and right okay he looks exactly like young Jeffrey Rush it's just it's eerily uncanny it's amazing how much they look alike <laughs> You should Google it. I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to have to look him up. It's amazing. So, anyway, what movie are we talking about this week? This week, we are talking about It Came From Hollywood from 1992. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a yoink from uh, Wikipedia, okay? Which, Which... Is an half homage of the cast was, to your blog. Half of the cast was dead by eighty by ninety two. Yeah, right. Uh, it it was came from 80. Hollywood is a nineteen eighty two comedy film compiling clips from various B movies written by Dana Olson and directed by Malcolm Leo and Andrew Salt. The film and you know what? Background segments. Yeah. I that name Andrew Salt seemed familiar to me. So I looked him up. He also directed uh, the documentary This is Elvis, which okay. I remember playing on VH1 like once a week. Yeah. And also he did Imagine John Lennon. Uh-huh. Okay. And there was a period, there was a period in my life when I was just obsessed with that movie. Imagine John <laughs> Lennon, the documentary, really beautiful. Yeah. I'm sure I've probably seen the both of them. I've seen quite a few on John Lennon. Um, because he's a little bit of a hero. And it pissed yeah. me off, okay? Because he, it, this really pisses me off. And this is when I kind of gave up on, on humans. Uh, he was shot my senior year in high school. Yeah. So when it came around to picking a class song, the choices were John Lennon's Imagine, Free Bird, and the theme from Mahogany. Do you know where you're going? Do you know that one? Yeah. Um And I was like, well, this is obvious. <laughs> and the class picked the theme from Mahogany. Ugh. And it was like, this man just died. <laughs> Shouldn't we pick that? And really... If we're not going to pick that, can't we pick Free Bird? You have to pick this piece of shit. <laughs> when I say Free Bird has been used uh, just a bajillion times in a bajillion movies, it's one of those songs that's just been used so much. But I'm kind of yeah, happy. but the the theme I'm from Mahogany for us. Go ahead. Oh yeah, the theme from Mahogany is horrible. But when I think of when I think of Free Bird, I'm happy at the fact that I think for a while I would always think of Forrest Gump and that scene where Jenny's just hopped up on smack or angel dust or whatever and she's about to oh, jump yeah. off the building. But now I think of the end of um, uh, that second Rob Zombie killer film, The Devil's Rejects. Devil's Rejects, huh? That's what I think of now when I think of Freebird. And I'm really proud of myself that I've switched from Forrest Gump to the Devil's Rejects. <laughs> That's a little golf clap for me and my brain. Where they pretty much played the whole song for that one. Yeah, yeah. That was and the that's whole impressive. end of the movie. Yeah. God, I hate Forrest Gump. <laughs> I hate that movie. Yeah. I just, God, it's just so cheesy. Oh, God. And I just, everybody loved that movie. It became this cultural milestone, and it's just, ugh. Yeah. I, I like it. I don't love it. And really, the tipping point for me on that movie is the Jenny character. You know, because yeah. she just added 
the right amount of darkness into that other otherwise bubblegum world. Yeah. That I that I I kind of liked. Yeah. I I was wanting her to jump. Jump, 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 jump. <laughs> you gotta jump, free bird is on. <laughs> <clears throat> it came from Hollywood. I love this movie. It is a classic. And I love the fact that it is available now on the internet and on YouTube because if I, I I have spent the majority of my life obsessed with bad movies. I I have spent so much time watching bad movies and obsessing over it. And if I had to kind of pinpoint the one time in my life when I be, really became obsessed with bad movies. It's it's the first time that I saw this film. Yeah. And I remember... It was like on a permanent loop on HBO. uh, And it was a movie that I... Like some movies like Johnny Dangerously made me sick because it was on all the time. It came from Hollywood. I loved each and every time I saw it. We killed a Radner. I think I mentioned this in another podcast. But... The Avengers, when I was young, was my Avengers, because I loved yeah. I loved Gilda Radner from uh, Saturday Night Live, and I loved Cheech and Chong from all of these movies that I really shouldn't have seen when I was younger, <laughs> and I loved Dan Aykroyd, and I loved John Candy from SCTV, and the idea of all of these just amazing comedians being in one film... I just remember going, well, I don't care what they're going to do, but I have to see this movie because it's all of these people that I love together in one film. And yeah. I just, I absolutely love it. So much so that whenever I see a movie that was featured in this, I just can't help but remember this movie and think of the lines. Especially, I love the Mystery Science Theater episode, The Amazing Colossal Man. Yes, but any but at the point where Glenn says, "I don't want to grow anymore. I don't want to grow anymore." I can't not do Cheech and say, "Except maybe some hair." <laughs> I have to do that. I love this movie, and this really, this movie, what 1982? It really was the first time that I had ever heard of Edward. Yes, it's probably the first time I ever heard of him as well. Although I'm pretty sure I heard of Plan 9 before. Yeah, yeah. Because Plan 9 from Outer Space, I think I may have... I remember the first time I saw Plan 9 from Outer Space, and I was in sixth grade, and I saw it was going to be on some UHF station at midnight, and I remember begging my parents to let me stay up and watch it. And they had no idea what I was talking about, but they knew I was passionate, and they said, okay, Stevie, fine. If you can stay up, Stevie, you Mm -hmm. can watch it. And I stayed up, and I watched every frame, and I'm like, this is not that bad. I don't know what John Candy is talking about. And I remember always grabbing the TV guide and looking to see if Plan 9 from Outer Space or Glenn Blenda was going to be on. And I don't, yeah. I don't think I saw Glenn or Glenda until the the Johnny Depp movie came out. But I was always looking for it because of this movie, and the beautiful, beautiful tribute that John Candy does to Ed, to Ed Wood, especially yeah. at the end where him and Dan Aykroyd are in drag. Oh, just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I love this movie, and it really and they, is just they, a clip film. Yeah, they they pointed out the. Uh the there scene from Plan 9 and Out of Space where where the wife is like, a, oh. The saucer is out there, there and the cemetery, cemetery yeah. is out there, but I'll be locked up in there. I know, and every time I, every time I see that, and whenever I'm actually watching Plan 9 as well, I'm like, that's really a funny line. That's a really funny chunk of dialogue. It's her performance that fucks it up. Yeah, it's an okay line. It's the way that she says it that just ruins everything. 
I mean, it's a nice little play on words that if you perform it differently, it, it's very good. But she just, like, didn't get the joke and didn't know how to do the line, and that's why it comes off very bland and stupid. Yeah. But I have to say that although this is supposed to be a like a clip film featuring a bunch of really bad movies, there are some pretty good movies that they show in this movie. They show The Day the Earth Stood Still yes. in this movie, and that's kind of a classic. Uh, the War of the Worlds, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, for Christ's sake. Mm-hmm. They feature the that in this movie. The Incredible Man. The Incredible Shrinking the Incredible Man. The Incredible Man was a very good movie. Um, yeah. The Fly. They show The Fly in this movie, and The Blob. The Fly is excellent. The Blob is a damn good movie, too. It hasn't aged well. Yeah. But come on, it's Steve McQueen, for God's sake. Right? And he did, in that movie, he does seem like a 30-year-old playing a 16-year-old. Yeah. I'm not sure how old he was when he made that movie, but he did seem like Beverly Hills 90210. You're probably a bit too old to be playing like a 16-year-old. <laughs> and again, House on Haunted Hill, they show the preview for that. Mm-hmm. And then immediately also, after the I also liked very much how they had it, they had them all broken up into sections. Yeah. I like the fact and, that around the middle they showed a bunch of previews. Yeah. Too. I mm-hmm. like that. And I remember that House on Haunted Hill was immediately followed by Black Belt Jones. <laughs> the punchinest, kickinest, choppinest dude ever to hit the big screen. He's big, he's black, and he's bad. I could probably recite the entire movie. Because that's how much really, this movie I, has meant to me in my life. I love it. I have movie. not seen it, but I have always wanted to see Black Belt Jones. Oh, I've seen Black Belt Jones because I was obsessed with Black Belt Jones because when I got older, I realized that the guy who plays Black Belt Jones was in freaking Enter the Dragon, for Christ's sake. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah. And I'm like, wow, so you were in a Bruce Lee movie and you were also in Black Belt Jones? How did that happen? What... How many movies have you done? I was obsessed with him for a while. But yeah. Black Belt Jones, it it is a difficult movie to get through now. All of As those black far- exploitation films are a bit difficult because you knew that although it is a film that's kind of celebrating black culture, there probably was a group of white and Jewish men who were making the film. And it's mm-hmm. it's a bit difficult to get through so many of the jive turkeys and honkies, and it, it's a bit of a yeah. difficult film. But oh, it's, he's he is amazing. He really he really was the black uh, the black Bruce Lee. Yeah, Bell yeah, yeah I think that's movie. very fair. Uh huh. Yeah, Black Bell Jones was amazing. Yeah, it, it is. It's on the bucket list. Yeah. And uh, what other? Uh, oh, and of course, the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. Just that title alone. You know, you can't go wrong with that title. I was at a I was at a friend's house. Uh, my friend Stephanie and I. We were at a friend's house. And uh, somebody was was, cha- was uh, going through the Netflix, and I saw that he passed by something, and I had to point it out. I had to say, you just passed the Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. That's the name of the movie. You passed it. It's called The Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. It's the world's first monster musical. The guy was like, what? I passed that? And, of course, Netflix just said the incredibly strange creatures dot, dot, dot. But, and I think it was the yeah. the, the uh, Mystery Science Theater version. But we sat there and we watched it. And it's <laughs> one of those movies that's just so bizarre that occasionally the movie would just suck in one or two people. Like, a, like, mm-hmm. it, like it was movie ninjaing everybody. Because it was so <laughs> bizarre that everyone was just gathering around it because it was so bizarre. I have a wonderful story about it came from Hollywood. 
I, I, I've always tried to seek out just every movie that has been featured in this film. And I've seen right. the majority of them. Frankenstein meets the space monster, son of Godzilla, ape, which we featured already on our sure. podcast, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. I just showed that to my kids and they just went nuts for it. But one of the movies that I was always searching for was The Thing with Two Heads. 1972 film, Rosie mm -hmm. Greer, big African-American man, mm -hmm. and they sew onto his body the head of a white racist. Rain. You had actually posted that on your blog a few years back. Yeah, I was. I, I've always, I've, I had always been looking for it, and then suddenly our TV got the the station this. Uh huh. And and I had never heard of the station before, but it was just this. This is Sacramento. This this is movies, and apparently. Like now, we get this here in Oklahoma, and the this the network this. Now they're showing some good movies. They they were showing uh, this is Spinal Tap the other day, and Fargo, and they had a Godzilla marathon. But when I first saw this, it was pretty much nothing but uh, copyright free movies. And they yeah. showed they showed the thing with two heads. That, but they only showed it once, and it was while I was working. So I begged oh. my wife. I said, please, I am working. I can't call in sick so I can watch the thing with two heads. Can you please watch this film, blog about it on my on my blog, and yeah. then, uh, you know, kind of review the film? And I had to beg her, and she just I don't want to watch this movie. This movie is going to be stupid. It's one of your horrible movies. Don't make me do it. So finally she said, okay, fine, I'll watch this movie. And right from the beginning, she was so blown away by how horrible it was that she wrote one of the longest posts on my blog. <laughs> she wrote about every second of this film. And to this day, she considers it one of her favorite movies. Really? The, yeah, Good The God. Thing with Two Heads. It's just such a bizarre film. Mm-hmm. And here's another bit of trivia. Here's another bit of trivia. I recently yeah. went to a Bed Bath and Beyond, and they have a. It's like Fury Duty. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. had to go to the Bed Bath and Beyond, but I noticed that there were DVDs, so of course I just gravitated towards the DVDs, and they had the thing with two heads. Cool. On DVD for four ninety nine. So apparently, the Beyond part of Bed Bath and Beyond are Rosie Greer movies, and that is just weird. <laughs> Bed Bath and the occasional Rosie Greer film. <laughs> they also had like Punky Brewster season two, and I thought, okay, well, this is a bit odd. <laughs> now what if you what if you grafted Punky's head to Rosie Greer? I I would I would watch that. But what about Brandon the dog? I hope Brandon will be okay. <laughs> now I'm worried. I absolutely love it came from Hollywood. It it started me literally on the road of loving bad movies. There is mm -hmm. the... A, I, I fell in love with it. I made it my mission to watch every movie that it, that was shown on it, and I've got a list here of all of the films that were featured in the movie because they show it at the end credits, and I would yeah. say about 80 or 90% of these movies I've seen. I, I think I've seen I've a lot of them. It. Some of them I haven't seen in like a 100 years, though. Yeah. You know, I, not since it was on whatever horror show in New York. Like, yeah. uh, um, I was a teenage Frankenstein. I saw that on Chiller Theater in New York. That was Channel 11, PIX. I think it might have become the CW. I'm not sure. Yeah. That happened after I left New York, so I'm not sure what it became. Um, but that was on Chiller Theater, and any, anybody from New York would remember. We didn't really have horror hosts. You know, the closest we got, like, I just, in my growing up, like, I just missed Zachary 
most famous yeah. horror beside yeah. um, Vampira. <clears throat> but, so yeah. I never actually saw him, and then after him, none of the channels that did horror shows really had a horror host. Channel 11 had Chiller Theater, which had this awesome claymation hand that came out of, like, a swamp. Yeah, I've seen that on, on YouTube. It's pretty awesome. Oh, God, and the music is great. So, like, I haven't seen it since then, and that would have had to have been, like, 72, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In Phoenix, we had a, a horror host, a local horror host in Phoenix, Arizona, and his name was Ed Scary. And he would make people take an oath. I promise every Friday night before I go to bed, miss, I'll tune in my TV to Channel 15 and watch the scary movie with Edmus. And I loved Edmus Scary, and I thought he was the best, but he you can't really find a thing about him because apparently, allegedly, he uh, was arrested for molesting children, and Ooh. so everyone quickly forgot about him. And he was on TV for a number of years, but once he did that one crime, then suddenly everyone said, okay, well, let's forget about this guy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, so I, I had Ed Scary, and then I also had uh, Elvira. I remember Elvira. I remember her yeah. introduction was just really creepy. And then you would actually watch the show, and it's her making a bunch of big puns, and she's got her boobs out. So I remember liking that, of course. She did not show up in New York until she started. She had already gotten popular and started showing up in commercials. Oh, yeah? So Elvira was somebody I just kind of heard about. But for a little piece of awesome, I just found I was a teenage Frankenstein on YouTube. Really? It That's is a uh-huh. horrible movie. I am going to be watching that one soon. I love yeah. the makeup. The makeup, and it's just when I was a kid, that makeup really creeped me out. Yeah? Yeah. It I, I was like, a bit weird. I like as Frankenstein, but, but the makeup is awesome. <laughs> of course, my favorite horror host now is Mr. Lobo and his show Cinema Insomnia. Yes, and he also has, we might try to get him as a guest one day, uh, he also has Zombie TV on Roku, yes. and he has a lot of interesting stuff on there. Uh, I did a piece of animation for him for Mark of the Devil, yes. so you'll see a little bit of my work on that episode. And then I uh, acted in two of his episodes. I was in the Bucket of Blood episode as a, a coffee patron, and then I played myself in the episode uh, featuring Roger Corman's Star Crash, which he had to pull because Roger Corman tried to sue him, but then it became, a, now it's it, it's a free domain, it's available I think on archive.org and possibly yeah. on its website, com. but I had always wanted... When I was in Sacramento, I had always wanted to see Plan 9 from Outer Space in a theater. I had never seen it before. So when, so I didn't realize that uh, Mr. Lobo and in Cinema Insomnia, that he did his stuff in Sacramento. And he had a showing of Plan 9 from Outer Space. And I was so absolutely on cloud nine excited to watch this movie in a theater that it became like Rocky Horror Picture Show except there was yeah. only one person saying anything, and it was me. And I was just con- I was just so excited, and I was just talking, and just constantly, like, so excited, and just so thrilled to be finally watching this movie, that afterwards, Mr. Lobo came up to me, and he said, wow, you know Planet Nine from Outer Space, and I told him about my religion, and he told me about his show, and so we became really good friends for a while until I moved. So he is a wonderful, wonderful person, and I just absolutely there's a, there's love another, him. There's another story there that you got to tell, though. Uh, eventually, he said to me, like, hey, we should, we should uh, get together and do a show. What do you, you want to do? What, what are you interested in? 
and I told him about something that I had done in high school, and we, uh, my buddies and I, all of the friends that I could get, we stayed up all night for 24 hours watching as many bad movies as we could, and I called it Ed Woodstock. So he, he being the crazy guy that he is, he spent a couple of thousand dollars, rented out the war, the like the like the Crest Theater in downtown Sacramento, California. And we got three amazing bands to play, and we showed Bride of the Monster. And it was literally just l like my dream come true. Like I, like I remember being in high school going, oh, imagine if we did Ed Woodstock at, you know, in an actual theater. Wouldn't that be incredible? And Mr. Lobo just waved his magic wand and made it happen. And it was absolutely incredible. Absolutely amazing. And to this day, we still talk every once in a while about maybe doing another one. And that's something that yeah. we might do in the future or, you know, a couple of years from now. But I'll be happy if that's, like, the one thing that I did in my life. Because it, cool. it was something I wanted to do when I was, a, like, a junior and a senior in high school. And I saw m myself on stage and I saw Ed Woodstock up in a marquee and it was just absolutely just a dream come true. Literally, figuratively, it was a dream. And I have, it came from Hollywood to thank for it. I mm -hmm. remember my mom saying, hey, they're going to show this movie on HBO. We're going to stay up. We're going to you know, roll the couch into a bed. We're going to lay down here and watch this movie together as a family, and it changed my life. Love, it came from Hollywood. On the religion. Such a good movie. <laughs> it is. It, it's an excellent movie. And the cast with, you know, Dan Aykroyd, a young Dan Aykroyd. And Dan Aykroyd, while well, he was still funny. Yeah. <laughs> I love the scene that he does where he's the one of the last surviving humans of an apocalypse, and it's his job to record what's happening for posterity's sake, but it apparently he's also a morning DJ. Yeah, so he's recording just the worst things. Starlog A10, <laughs> day 12. Hello and good morning to you on this cloudy Thursday. Really <laughs> wonderful. There are some wonderful little scenes there. And seeing uh, Gilda Radner do her, like, perfect little girl impression that she did on Saturday Night Live. It, mm -hmm. Oh, it's just so good. And Cheech and Chong, for Christ's sake. Cheech yeah. and Chong, they're still around. <laughs> I love Tommy Chong at the concession stand. Just oh, yeah. Just throwing that candy and everything. And you know I like to indulge a little bit so I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a mommy size. Give me a daddy size. Yeah. Like, every other time I go to a theater, I will ask them for the daddy size. Yeah. Because <laughs> this movie has just stuck with me in, like, really weird, bizarre ways. Like, every once in a while, like, around Halloween, I will, like, adopt my Vincent Price voice and just, you'll see human heads without bodies. <laughs> pools of blood dripping from the ceiling. The house on Haunted Hill, where so far the guests have only murdered seven people. So won't you come and make it eight? <laughs> I used to work with a guy named Lance, and Lance happened to be the ace test pilot from House on Haunted Hill. So if for like a year or two, when I would work with him, every time I would see him, I would just, Hello, Lance. Do you think you're brave enough to spend the night on the house on Haunted Hill? And, and of course, that was eyes. The, yeah, and of course that was the great William Castle, another another big hero of mine. I, I appreciated his showmanship. Yeah, and and his movies in general are, are not 
really bad movies. The House on Haunted Hill, I mean, it's a little cheesy with time. Yeah. You know, but it's a good movie. But then, of course, he also did The Tingler and Mr. Sidonicus and quite a few others. I find this odd, but The House on Haunted Hill is my youngest daughter's favorite movie. Really? I have no idea why, but she watches that movie maybe about five or ten times a year. She's just absolutely obsessed with it. She just loves how spooky it is and black and white and Vincent Price, and she just she is in love with that movie. Yeah. We watch the Rift Tracks version. We watch the regular version. She just loves The House on Haunted Hill. She just thinks Vincent <laughs> Price is the bee's knees. And yeah. All the other girls are watching, like, Barbie and the Crystal Palace. And she's just, Daddy, can I watch Can I watch it, The Brain That Wouldn't Die? No, can I watch The House on Haunted Hill again? <laughs> I'm raising these kids right. You are. On the classic. You are. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, the the oldest is about to go on and be a teenager, you yeah. know, so she's going to be really annoying for a few years, but then she'll come she's back. On, she's on YouTube a lot. Yeah. A lot. She is just constantly on YouTube. And apparently, young people on YouTube think it's okay to just watch another person play video games. <laughs> like somehow it's popular to watch another person play video games on YouTube for two hours. I I I don't understand. Sure, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can't I can't wait to freak people out with that. That's gonna be wonderful. That that is Bob's Dirty Shorts premiering yes. Halloween. Yes. And we we do take these shows in advance, and we're getting a little far ahead of ourselves. So, like, by the time this one comes out, Halloween's probably already going to be passed. Yes. So, but we'll get that back on track. Yay. <laughs> Anybody want a sneak peek? Well, well, again, the show's probably going to be out there, so nobody's going to need a sneak peek anymore. But oh, yeah, Bob's the, Dirty, Bob's Shorts. Dirty Shorts will be out there by now. Yeah. Uh, I am aiming to be the most demented thing on YouTube. That's that's my goal. Yes. And I have seen a sneak peek of this. And if you want to freak out your Facebook friends, <laughs> just be sure and share a couple of Bob's Dirty Shorts. It's really going to be a deal breaker. I can't wait. Somehow, I am friends with a lot of uh, right-wing Christian Republicans who somehow have not befriended me yet, and so I can't yeah. wait to put a couple of these on my uh, on my status <laughs> update and just just like like a like a rap artist dropping the mic. I'm gonna drop this on my Facebook and back up and see what happens. I can't wait. <laughs> It's going to be fun. <laughs> I am kind of expecting at one point, if it gets popular enough, the cops might be by here just to sort of check some shit out. Yeah, <laughs> one of those, like, uh, checking to see if everything's okay. Like yeah. a wellness check. Yeah. yeah. That might be good. We just want to make sure you're not really demented. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how uh, would they know? I could put on a good act. Yeah, that's a good point. We do tape these shows in advance, so I just want to let the audience know that um, by the time this podcast episode comes out, we are expecting the president to have become a mad emperor who has killed half of the population off with Ebola, and that he is now an evil, twisted overlord who is killing all the Christians. Well, well, he invented Ebola. That's the thing. He, he invented yeah. Ebola because say what you want, you know, say what you want. Muslims are really good geneticists. That's a good point. That's a good point, especially Hawaiian those, Muslim geneticists. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, they fell behind. They really haven't. Again, like Golden Earring, they had algebra and now genetics. So I cannot wait for a for another Republican president to be in the White House because I am going to make it my mission to create as many conspiracy theories for him <laughs> as there are right now for our current Democratic president. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or a Green Party or whatever. I just feel that everything needs to be even. So as I... soon as a Republican president comes along, I'm just going to start start it out. He's got robots He's got robots hidden on the border, yeah. ready to kill, uh, ready to kill all of the Native Americans. I'm going to be like Criswell. I'm going to start predicting it. Yeah. Where I kind of stand is like I don't like politicians. I don't really like any goddamn one of them. You know, I mean, there's the old joke. How do you know a politician's lying? Just look for movie. You know. So, yeah. I didn't like George Bush. How the hell could you? And I don't particularly like Obama. But if but you the think thing about that Obama, the president is the problem, then you don't really know what the problem is. But the thing about Obama is I dislike the people who dislike Obama more than I dislike Obama. That's a good point. So, so I kind of give him a pass. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There are some things I really think he fucked up on, but that's besides the point. There are enough freaks out there to tell you all about that. You don't need it from me. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should start. So I don't know who I don't know who the next president is, but I already guarantee you I will not like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's just that's just how I go. <laughs> Maybe I should start becoming a like a psychic. Like Criswell. I mean, if the oh, Long really? Island medium can do it, then it can't be that difficult. I'm going I'm to try mm -hmm. and be a psychic. I need a really good suit. Well, you're also more of a small, though, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well maybe I'll yeah. get a really nice suit with some shoulder pads. Or, or maybe you can do things like, you know, channel Billy Barty. Ooh. You know? Yeah. Something like Billy that. Billy Barty was in Lobster Man from Mars. You need a white suit. You need a white suit. And I would really love you to do an, an Ed Wood show as a religious show. That would be nice. Give a I lesson of Wood once a when week. When I think of the white suit, I, I, I immediately start thinking talking heads, but yeah, I could pull that off. I'm going with Southern Baptist minister, you know, the really yeah. annoying ones. Yeah, like like uh, like kids in the hall, like every comedian needs a preacher character. Yeah. Like that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll at least need a bolo tie. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll keep... <laughs> I'll keep I'll keep looking around the Goodwills, see if I can find a bolo tie to try and make this ensemble work. Well, that's that's where Jeannie finds my dresses. Yeah. Well, good, good. I love Goodwill. I spent most of my childhood at Goodwill. Stay tuned for more about that. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I love Goodwill. Goodwill's amazing. What the fuck? It's suddenly making... Sorry, something on my computer just started making noise. That was probably a ghost. It probably was. We may have just been haunted by the ghosts of all the children that were killed in Vietnam. There's no other answer for it. Uh, I can accept that. Cool. I can accept that because it would not be the first time that I have seen burning napalm children in my dreams. 
Wow, that's awesome. And I don't want to talk about it, man. (laughs) I don't remember a lot of my dreams, so the ones I do remember are usually movie-related. Movies are just usually my life. My older brother and I, we could spend a whole day just talking in movie quotes. I remember most of my dreams, and if I want to, I can lucid dream. That's awesome. I I tried that. I really tried to develop lucid dreaming when I was in high school, just so I could kind of bang all of the chicks that I couldn't bang. (laughs) And I got close. Like, I would be in bed with them, and they would be on top of me, but then they'd just be wagging their finger, just going, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, not happening. And I'm like, damn it, I got this close. Write more fiction. I think I really think that's that's where it happened. Really? Yeah. Okay. Because you know, because I would I would write something and then I would rewrite it and I would rewrite it and I would rework the story and go over the story and all that. Where after a while, I started doing that in my dreams. Like I don't I don't like the scene. <laughs> Scratch it. Let's take that out and do this instead. Well, I might have to do that again. I really just want the power to crush all my enemies in my dreams. <laughs> the, the problems with it is, one, you are asleep, so it's kind of like you're a little drunk. Okay. Okay. And the second, to, to really kind of doing it, you, you're really not that very much asleep. You're not getting a really good deep sleep, so you kind of wake up a lot more tired. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't remember a lot of my dreams... But I do know that almost all of my dreams feature music, which I will remember as soon as I wake up. Because I will wake up just, tick-tock on the clock, but the party don't stop. Ah, damn it, this is going to be all day now. It's just going to be all day (laughs) with this damn song. Damn it, I must have dreamed it because it's just, it just, it's... Like, I wake up, and there will be one song that will have just played in my head, and it will just stay with me through the rest of the day. (laughs) I've got, like, Casey Kasem in my dreams every night. Oh. Really horrible. (laughs) Tonight on Steve Dreams, we've got Iggy and it's just really horrible. I don't remember the dream, but I remember that the soundtrack to Top Gun was in it, so this is going to be a wonderful day. <laughs> we should wrap this episode up. Oh, but what come are on. you? We've got, final. <laughs> we've got so much more to say about Ooh, what are you? came final from Hollywood. Thought. Uh-huh. Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages. <laughs> Tucson, Arizona. There's just so much more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wanted what, to, what is your parting song? I wanted to do a quick shout-out to a website that I just learned about, and it's really amazing. I just wanted to do a quick ad for it. Um, right. It's called Google... And apparently you could just look up anything. I don't know if you've heard about it. All the kids are talking about it. Yeah, it's getting kind of popular. It's getting kind of yeah. popular. Eventually they, they will take over the world. I thought it was a but, band. But I don't like using Google as a verb. I try and use everything else before I will say Google it. I say, oh, yeah, it's really interesting. You should Yahoo it. Or you should bing that up. Or um, <laughs> ask Jeeves it. Maybe you should alter <laughs> this to that. Uh-huh. And, um... Lycos. Yeah, <laughs> Lycos it. I will use uh-huh. those a million times before I try and say Google it. Because that's just, that's just giving them more power. They're so, they're so powerful already. Don't turn them into, like, Skeletor up there and on their mountain. Just Yahoo uh-huh. it. Just bing it. It's really nice. <laughs> so why don't you mention all of the the ways that you can hear us? 
all of the ways oh, you can get in touch with us. We've got hey. a million things. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. You and can if actually you don't, then the terrorist a- wins. That is correct. You can actually even direct download from the website undeadcow.com. Uh, you can watch us on YouTube, and cool. that is preferred because that is what's monetized, and we're hoping to make a little money. You know, so Please. click it before you go to work. Yeah. <laughs> we are. We also have a Facebook page, the Pope on Pill, so come like that and join the fun there. Yes. We are also on Twitter at um, – I don't have it in front of me. Come on. At Pope on Film. Cool. On Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. And you can email us at Pope at UndeadCow.com. Awesome. And we are on Stitcher. Which is a place about stitching. So if you're a big fan of of um, making quilts or blankets. Exactly. Or... Um, brain implants, or maybe even just C-sections. Stitcher. I'm not sure what that is. It's what's for dinner. Awesome. And if you would (laughs) like to learn more about today's movie, it will be available on my blog. Just go to reverendsteve.blogspot.com, and today's movie, It Came From Hollywood, will be there, along with a whole bunch of other cool stuff and perhaps boobs. Excellent. And while you were there, read through the rest of the articles, because there's a lot of good reading on that blog. Yes, it's pretty good and pretty weird. There's there's cute pictures of my kids, and then free songs and movies and occasional boobs. So it, it's, it's a really bizarre look into my mind, and I'm not sure if you want to go there, but if you want to, <laughs> boom. It's awesome. And also check out my other podcast, Dying Generation. Which yeah, I do with pretty, my friend Steve Norfolk. It's pretty awesome. And Bob's Dirty Shorts. Catch that Bob's on YouTube Dirty as well. Shorts. Yay! <laughs> really great way to freak out people on Facebook. Yes. Yes. Let's make this the 2010s or whatever this decade is called. Let's yep. make this the Rick Roll of this decade. Oh, awesome. Okay. I can get behind okay. that. I can get yeah. behind that. I can really get behind that. Yeah. yeah. You just roll somebody an episode of Bob's Dirty Shorts. Yeah. Like someone's having a hard day. It's like, here, this video will help you. Boom. Freak them out. <laughs> so until next time. I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve Galindo. Join us next week on The Pope on Film. Yes, see you next week, uh, bizarre movie fans. <laughs>